Numerical Computation, Chapter 11, Video 9. So we begin this video by making the observation that both the explicit and the implicit Euler time step, they are first order in time. And we have a space discretization using central final difference that is second order. So it would be very desirable to match that order also for the time derivative. So we would like to have a second order in time also. We now introduce a method that is also second order in time. So how can we do this? So the thinking behind was to think that um, we now are going to um, approximate um, the derivatives at the point um, at t n plus half and uh, x j. Okay, so at that point, and you throw in a central finite difference to approximate the derivative in time. Now this becomes central finite difference, and that's a second order one. And then in space, the second order derivative in x now is taken as the average between a central final difference at step Tn and a central final difference at step Tn plus 1. So each of these approximation on its own, this is of order delta x square, and this approximation is of order delta x square. And if you add the two values up and take the average to approximate the value in the middle, and this is again a second order approximation in x. So, altogether, this gives us a second order in time and in space. Okay, so you can think everything here in this new scheme is like a central final difference. Okay, so um, this method is called Crank Nicholson time step. Now um, let's um, introduce a notation. Um, if we multiply that scheme by delta t on both sides, we see that this constant here, delta t over 2 times delta x squared, would appear on every term on the right-hand side. So we just call this a number. Let's call it r. That will be a constant. Okay, And then we can clean up a little bit. And what we did was um, we move all the terms containing n plus 1, and we move them all to the left, and all the term at time step Tn, we move them to the right. So just pure algebraic manipulation, we end up with this, this um, discrete, um, kind of a discrete uh, heat equation and with the Crank-Nicholson time step. Okay? And of course, um, the iteration scheme is equipped with initial condition and boundary conditions. So that's the initial condition, and these are the boundary conditions. So that's the same as for all other methods. Okay, so um, take a closer look at um, the scheme labeled by equation number one, and we see that um, everything at n, these are given at that step, and we are wishing to compute unknowns at level n plus 1. So each equation now involves, again, um, three unknowns. So write it out as a system, we would again get a tridiagonal system. And that has to be solved at t every time step. Okay, so here's the um, computational stencil. It just shows you how many points are involved in uh, one equation. Okay, so at time step n, I need three points information there, and I use this to determine three points um, at time step n plus 1. So these three at an unknown level, neighboring three, again, like in the implicit method, this is what gives us in the end a tridiagonal structure. Okay, so as we argued before, the method now is second order in both time and space, meaning your arrow is bounded by some constant times delta t squared plus some constant times delta x squared. Now, for the stability of Crank-Nicholson's method, one can prove that the method is actually 
unconditionally stable, but、um, the stability for this method is not with respect to the discrete maximum principle. It's measured in a different norm. It's actually the、um, discrete L2 norm of the unknown vector will be non-increasing in time. So the proof for that involves a little bit more、um, linear algebra matrices and eigenvalues and vector matrix norms. So、um, we'll not go into the detail. If you're curious, you can、um, Google and you immediately find detailed computations in many places online. Okay, so check it out for your own curiosity. Okay, so hope、um, that's useful, and see you next time.